welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal people, and we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Jeff? Good evening. And me, your host, Benjamin DeCampos, a designer and believer. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, which is what we're doing now, and then we publish the notes. Check these notes out at our website, eclecticist.co.uk. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is American politics. American politics, as seen from the UK, particularly during the election season, a season being a few years, is essentially one big sitcom. Palin, Bush, Gore, hanging chads, God, guns, and gays, etc. Not a funny sitcom. There's a kernel of truth to the BBC's reporting, but it's more often, isn't America dumb? Aren't we wonderful? Living in the United States, as I do now, and seeing how the sausage is made, it's more complicated than a one-note show with an obnoxious laugh track. America is a big country, so you're bound to have huge swaths of smart people, along with equally huge numbers of ignoramuses. Ignorami? The latter is the low-hanging fruit ripe for UK sensational headlines. That being said, Trump really exists. We're not going to be talking about cyclical vomiting syndrome. So this is a very large topic, American politics. Um, Living in the UK, as I do, and being British, as I am, I'm very interested in American politics. I see a lot of parallels. We have very similar systems. And there's plenty of exposure here in the media about what's going on at any particular time. And of course, there's the global reach and implications of American politics for the rest of the world. So certainly it's a case of how American politics works domestically and also how the American political system and its general politics are perceived by the rest of the world. So I think it's probably a good idea to have a look at what it means and what it does from both sides of the pond. So I've written some history. Uh, I've had a look at the timeline for American politics, because I think politics and the history of the country are intertwined. There's, there's no way you can't look at one without looking at the other. So America is a relatively new country. Um, it is quite a different sort of country. It's a country that was designed Uh, And I think this is where the phrase American exceptionalism comes from. The fact that they thought about the sort of civilization they would like to create, and they thought about how to apply constraints to society in order that the best representation and distribution of power could be made, um, which is an amazing feat to even take on, let alone achieve, in my opinion. So before we go into the history, um, just to mention the the different sorts of political systems. So when we say politics, what do we mean? We mean how societies are forged and maintained, how best can we all get along, and what kind of systems and structures do we need to put in place to assure safety, consistency, and progress. Uh, These are largely, from my research, a monarchical system, so a king or a queen or some sort of hereditary passing on of the control of power. There's dictatorship, so some form of hard-won tyranny uh, where you have a very few few ruling the many um, in a a dictatorial way in that, you know, you follow the rules or it's, uh, it's fascism town. And then we have the various versions of democracy, whereby the intention is that the population at large has some say in how a particular society is run. Um, There are a few other different types of political systems out there, but they're 
too abstract for me to fully understand or even understand in the slightest bit. So I've not included them in the list. But uh, going from the historical context, how do you understand the history of American politics? Do you have any fundamental grounding in it? Or did you ever study it in school? No, I didn't. And it was always been very mysterious to me. And I think to a lot of people, as I said in the introduction, it seems that there was, it was just sensational headlines. And plus, you and I, we weren't, kind of, we weren't kind of brought up in that sort of environment. You know, we were brought up in the UK. <laughs> and so all we heard, really, was what the BBC told us. And it would be the more sillier items, as I already said. But I've been trying to get my head around a lot of this stuff. Mainly for a couple of reasons. One is, I live here. And the other one is something that I heard Bill Maher say, uh, a little soundbite from Bill Maher like a couple of years ago, where he was talking about the American population being dumb. And he brought out some statistic about how few people actually know what the three branches of the American government are. And so that got me thinking, because I didn't. So I've been trying to understand it. And um, so far you know, mixed results. Yeah, it certainly seems complicated. Uh, when I was in school, uh, we studied American politics. Really? And it was, I, fa- I found it fascinating. It was extremely interesting. I was very quickly impressed by just how incredibly complicated it seemed to be. And I didn't understand large parts of it. I didn't see the utility of certain aspects of the governmental structure at all. I just did not get how it worked. And I think the biggest part, and we'll get to this, was the electoral college voting system. I fundamentally didn't understand it back then in school, uh, but luckily it wasn't an exam question. However, I've come to appreciate the system, and I, and, uh, and I appreciate more the intention behind it. I think the founding fathers were geniuses. What they had in mind was incredible, especially for the time. It was just unbelievably sophisticated. They were so far-sighted in a good way when it came to exactly what the problems might be in the distant future of the system. Uh, it really was incredible. But uh, let me just whip through the American, the history of American politics as I've researched it. And uh, history being history, it's quite linear, which is always good, especially for bullet points in our notes, which you can read along to if you pop along to our website, I hasten to add, eclecticist.co.uk. You can uh, have a look at this uh, historical list of political moments uh, as I go through them. So it all began, or at least one of the beginnings, was way back in 1140-ish. Hard to tell because this is before the Gregorian calendar, so who knows where the moon was. In 1140-ish, we had the Iroquois, and I've murdered that, Constitution. This was a sort of set of binding lawful documents for between several tribes uh, of the what we now refer to as the indigenous American peoples. So there were already documents uh, that tried to encapsulate certain sets of rules in order to have a more ho- harmonious society. Um, which is American because it happened in America. And then jump forward to 1620-ish, which was still before the Gregorian calendar. Um, We had the Mayflower Compact. Uh, Again, this is a document that tried to set a list of rules for the original settlers uh, in the Plymouth colony. 1639, we had Fundamental Orders. This was 11 laws that were ratified, uh, again, in the Connecticut colonies in the first 13. Jump ahead more than 100 years, and we have the Stamp Act in 1765. The Stamp Act was a very unpopular British tax. So we're still a colony here in the United States, and uh, there is a, a basically a tax code given to all of the settlers, which enforced tax payments directly to England. So not through any sort of proxy, but a a direct payment system across the Atlantic. Uh, 1773, not long thereafter, we had the Boston Tea Party. This is a sort of terrorist incident when 
cargo from some of the container ships coming across the Atlantic uh, were invaded and uh, had their cargo dumped into the Boston Harbor. Um, certainly seen as a terrorist incident by the British, of course. Uh, 1775 to 1783, there's the Revolutionary War. And then in 1776, of course, there is the Declaration of Independence, which is basically a document that says, we are our own man. We are our own sovereign nation. We don't need you anymore, horrible, awful, monarchical empire. And the first paragraph here, I think is, I mean, all Americans should recognize this, but I think it is an amazing, it shows an amazing conservation of words, and it's very concise. Again, it's 1776, and back in the 1800s, everything that I've ever read from the 1800s seems so bloated with unnecessary verbiage, and yet this seems quite svelte in comparison. So I'm going to read it out. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So obviously super mega famous, and you know one of the underlining distinctions of the American um, outlook. I never really understood what unalienable means uh, i don't that that don't, does that mean anything i don't quite understand what that means but I, I understand what it's getting at but beautiful and absolutely the cornerstone of the american uh, of american political thought in general um speeding forwards uh by 10 ish years 1787 we have the american constitution uh again another immense document uh it's a set of rules uh by which america is governed, basically. It's, it's the most uh, important document in American political history. 1791, again, not long thereafter, the Bill of Rights, which was just a list of amendments to the Constitution. 1881 to 1865, of course, we have the Civil War. So this was a horrible, awful war that came about owing to the large differences between the northern states and the southern states. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was uh, heavily involved, as we know. Um, all of the northern states voted him in, all of the electoral colleges, and none of the electoral colleges in the southern states, so it was a bit um, divisive, as you can imagine. 1863, in January, we had the Emancipation Proclamation. This is another super powerful political document, this time from Abraham Lincoln, and it was effectively free the slaves. Uh, and again, I just need to read just uh, the first part of this. It was very short. The first part reads very well. That on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Awesome. So you know, absolute trailblazers in the abolition of slavery. Uh, Incredibly powerful politics for America and the rest of the world. Uh, 1863, the same year in November, we had the Gettysburg Address. So Gettysburg was the site of a major battle uh, during the Civil War. It was particularly horrible and awful. And the address was given by uh, someone else. I forget who it was, but it wasn't Abraham Lincoln. Uh, The address was about two hours long, uh, but then Abraham Lincoln swung in and he gave a very small address, about two minutes, and uh, it was very much about our glorious dead. Um, And of course he said, uh, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And this led to the 13th Amendment, and that truly was the abolition of slavery. So that's the early history of the politics proper 
of America. Certainly one of the principal drivers of it was fleeing monarchical oppression by the British Empire um, and taking control of their own resources and trying to build a means to rule with the largest possible participation of the population, which is, you know, utterly admirable, I think, in intent. And um, I learned that uh, this whole voting in the general election on a Tuesday, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, is because it allows for voters to travel to the polling station because it's a big country. And if you tell people that they need to vote on Tuesday, they have time to get to the polling station after church and prayers on Sunday, which is quite interesting. What's the problem with inalienable or unalienable? Inalienable rights. I don't. What do they mean by well, that? Well, it's a word. I just looked it up. It says unable to be taken away from or given away by the possessor. These men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What, God actually said that? Oh, I see. Like, right. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Where does it say that? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's totally made up. It's like basically we're, we're saying, we're telling God what he's telling us. It's like, hey, well, we, we know the mind <laughs> God of God. Could very well pop down and, he could very well pop down and say, hey, you know, you're putting words in my mouth. I didn't say anything of the sort. This is slander. But yet he hasn't. Yet he hasn't. So we've gotten away with it so far. So what do you understand by the three branches? We're moving on to structure here. So the actual political system, what does it look like? The three branches of government? Well, before we go down that road, um, just another point of comparison between my understanding of American politics and my understanding of British politics. When I was in the UK, I didn't really understand British politics either. <laughs> and But I think that the difference there is... I was kind of infected with a kind of British cynicism when it came to politics, kind of believing that it doesn't really matter who you vote for, anyone you vote for will screw you over. And um, I th th there was that kind of general tone in the media. And when, when stuff was reported, particularly on the BBC, they kind of assume you have some kind of background knowledge of what the party stood for. Um, in you know, in in a, even in a general sense, so they kind of more just sort of spoke about you know gaffes that someone would have said, or you know, two Jags Prescott, or, or whatever it is. But I think that was a kind of of a British thing here in the United States. I've noticed it's like there's a slightly different attitude. The normal people are actually more interested in politics, and I think it's the same thing where you see American flags in certain, you know, everywhere. It doesn't look bad if you are even slightly patriotic. You know, if you have an American flag in the front of your house, you know, that that's fine. And I think people are kind of proud to be Americans and therefore they kind of go that extra mile in trying to understand how the politics of their country works. So like the average people I speak to about American politics, they tend to know quite a lot. And I never found that in the UK about UK politics, people just say, no, I don't know, <laughs> who knows, whatever. Yeah, my family have always been Labour, so that's me. But I don't really know anything sort of granular about it. Interesting. Um, that's not my, uh, my experience. I think uh, people take a great deal of interest, who I speak to in this country, about exactly what's going on. And more, they're more interested in, I think the impression I get is they're more interested in the individual's where? In this country. I mean, this is potentially controversial, but in this country, in the UK, when I have conversations about politics with people, they're more interested in the individual personalities. So the leaders of the parties, for instance, and what their views are and the sort of person that they think they are. Whereas in the United States, I think it's more about the party itself, the allegiances to the main parties and what the general political directions the major parties take and not so much the personality of the leaders. Or the, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I am, and no doubt I'm completely wrong there, but that's a general sense. Here of it. in the United States, there's more being made out of historical context with certain parties, I've noticed. But in the UK, like, for example, I mean, you know, we obviously know different people. 
But it seems like in the UK, people were kind of satisfied with like the bullet points that they read in a newspaper for what each party stands for and kind of just run with that. And there's a couple of well-known instances where, you know, a party will get into government and do something that they never mentioned in their manifestos. Like, for example, when New Labour got in, uh, there was this influx of um, Eastern European economic migrants that no one had voted for, and it was not part of any of their press pack, but there they are. Um, And I think that was one instance where there was a kind of palpable indignation from the general populace as to, you know, this is not what we voted for, what the hell's going on here? And I think that might have affected me. And it kind of it doesn't really matter who well, you that, vote that was. For. That was the whole disaster of misunderstanding with EU membership, in that we all thought it was an agreement f- to join a common market, but when in fact there was a federal aspect to it, and we had a whole bunch of uh, laws coming over. So it was the hidden agenda of federalism, uh, which was under the carpet of the common market, which was. A, you know, a total disaster. But perhaps that'll be a topic for another time. Yeah, perhaps. But my my general point is that I just don't think people are that interested. And I also think that the information isn't that accessible. And I think it's deliberately so. I, I that's not my experience at all. The people I speak to read the manifestos. <laughs> they read it's all in the manifesto. So I agree that when you have a, a U turn on a newly elected party. Uh, you know, when you have a, a direct contradiction of a manifesto pledge, that's a problem. And, you know, that's newsworthy. And, of course, the media being the media, everything's sensationalized. Uh, but there are also sober media outlets who will, you know, be a little bit more analytical and uh, and spell it out what, what when like? parties are... How, how do you mean? Well, more sober... No, which media outlets are you talking media about? Media outlets? Well, the... Quality newspapers, okay. the Independent, the Absurder, no, 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 uh, no, the no, no, no. That's, Jeff, that's wrong because you know, the Financial Times. you know, each of those newspapers has a political stance, and so anything you read, any of those newspapers, will be from a perspective. Every, every, everything is from a perspective. Yeah, but that's that sucks. <laughs> I want to hear impartial. That's life. Yeah, well, I'm just saying that life needs to change. Okay, well, you and I have different experiences of this, but the point I'm making is that in the UK, I just. I didn't know anyone who really gave it much of their time. They certainly didn't read any manifestos. And these aren't like total morons. These are just people that went about their lives. And this kind of thing, they just sort of tuned out of. And also, this is post-spitting image. Yes, post-spitting image. How many failed attempts there have been to bring it back? I just No, but you remember when, when we were kids, we know who all these people were. Because they had a, a rubbery avatar. <laughs> It's true. So, leaping back to the structure of the political system in the United States, what do you understand by the three branches of government? Nothing. As an American. (laughs) Nothing. What do you understand about the three branches of government? The main thing I have always understood about the three branches of government from school is that the idea behind it was that we, the, the American founding fathers didn't want to concentrate power. They didn't want to give somebody all of the power and also the power to change the entire political structure. So, you know, you don't want to vote somebody in democratically for them to become a tyrannical dictator and, you know, wash away the democratic rights of the population. So the founding fathers were so incredibly intelligent. And again, with the driver of all of the existing political systems behind them, um, they divided the power up into different domains. So one domain couldn't lose it entirely without the other two domains stepping in to slow it down. So that's extremely clever. And that division fell, uh, creating three domains uh, between, you know, um, creation, execution, and evaluation. Basically, those are the three branches of the government. And they are termed legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. So legislator, legislature is like, you know, when everybody gets together, the Congress. So that's the U.S. Capitol building. The executive are the elites. So that's the president and his cabinet in the White House. And then the judiciary or the judicial branch, uh, which are the courts, the actual 
experts who are evaluating the laws and determining whether this is sort of like the philosophical branch. They're the ones trying to determine whether a law is a law. Uh, and they're the ones who resolve the larger disputes. So it's the Supreme Court that we always hear about with their, their nine representatives who are, you know, lifetime peers, as it were. And then you have all the circuit courts and all the federal courts throughout the land. But it's clever the way the founding fathers, you know, put, uh, constraints and limitations and, and safety valves on the whole seat of power in its entirety. I mean, that's absolute genius. Uh, you know, that's, that's American exceptionalism in action. So I was always very impressed by that, but, uh, but I was all, I was always lost in the details of what each one actually does and, you know, who, who is actually doing what in each one. And it was only yesterday that I learned the executive branch employs more than 4 million people. 4 million people receiving checks directly from the executive branch of government. That seems like a scandal to me. I mean, it blows my mind that over 20 million people are directly employed by the government. It seems like insanity to my brain, but apparently that's a fact. I mean, can you believe that? Big government, you know, <laughs> it's a really big government in the United States. As democratic as, the, as America seems, the size of the government and the, the reach of its power is pretty scary. I sort of understand why Americans want to have guns. You know, you don't want to give the government even more power by giving them all the weapons as well. It's, uh, it seems kind of crazy to me from my, my perspective. Again, the structure is important because it really is, it's, it's the foundation that the aptly named founding fathers put down. They put down these houses uh, bicameral, I think they call them, um, whereby you distribute all of the power, and yet you do not diminish the power. So, as I've mentioned, the legislature branch contains the Congress. So the Congress is the meeting of all of the country's representatives, and that has two houses. So it has the Senate, and it has the House of Representatives. And... um. You have the executive branch, which is the president and his cabinet. Now, it's not a cabinet in the way in which I understand a cabinet uh, here in the UK. It's more... Like a wooden box. Uh, yeah, it's more a um, a bunch of advisors. So it's advisors in, you know, in every discipline and every arena of economic activity or social interest. Uh, so lots of uh, advisors, many of whom the president hires or has a hand in hiring. And the president hires or appoints a huge amount of people in government. It's amazing how many people he personally appoints. You know, lots of the circuit judges in the judiciary branch he appoints. He cannot appoint anybody without it being, you know, without a vote, without a vote going through Senate. He has to have a majority of votes in order to you know, um, appoint anybody into a very high ranking role in the government. And, uh, also his appointments can be contested, I believe, but he did, he certainly does spend a lot of time hiring people. It's quite amazing. Um, so you have these, these branches and that is the sitting government. You know, that's how government actually functions. You know, it's 20 million plus employees running the country, taking all the taxes, making the big decisions, um, paying and, you know, managing the military. But for me, the more interesting aspect of American politics is how individuals and parties are elected into power. <laughs> that seems, it seems to me that the real challenge for the founding fathers and all of the governmental, um, axioms in the various documents is how do you fairly elect representatives for the population? And it's a big population. It's over 300 million people now. So how do you best reflect their, their wishes in the electoral process? So, you know, we're, we're, we're skipping ahead a bit perhaps, but the presidential race is from my perspective, living in another country, it seems insane that it's literally a year and a half to two years of campaigning for the general election. I mean, that is 
immense. I mean, the news every day for years is all about, you know, the next presidential nominee or even the party nominee. And the millions of dollars that are spent on the campaign trail, it's just absolutely incredible. I mean, in this country, we have the EU referendum coming up in a couple of weeks. And potentially, depending on the, you know, if if the EU referendum is overwhelmingly for Britain to leave uh, the EU membership, potentially... Our Prime Minister, um, James Cameron, didn't he do Terminator? I forget. David Cameron, um, he could say, all right, let's have a general election by the end of the year. So, you know, no a couple of Novembers hence, literally, we could have a different government before Christmas. (laughs) The speed is incredible. Uh, That would never happen in America. In America, it's so unbelievably drawn out. But at the same time, you could argue that it's potentially more democratic because the way in which your representatives are elected is potentially more democratic from the very outset. Um, But at the same time, you have real complicating factors for us foreigners to understand, like the electoral college system. So that, on the face of it, seems incredibly weird, the electoral college system. But I now understand how much sense it actually makes. What do you understand by the electoral college system? And, and is, this something, is this something that's discussed? Do you discuss this? Or do you hear about this? Is it, is it covered in the media? Uh, I haven't looked out for it, so I haven't noticed it. And I've never heard about it until you mentioned it. So why don't you tell us what it is? So the way American politics works, it's hierarchical and, and tree-like because you have representatives. I mean, not, not every American citizen can walk up to Obama and, and talk to him about a, a particular issue. Obviously, you have a scale issue. You have 300 million people. So how do you represent every individual at a local level, at a, you know, a district level, at a state level, uh, you know, at a party level? How do you do that? You know, it's going to fan out into the, all the way down to the individual. So the electoral college system was invented in order to best represent the fewest possible people in the most honest and accurate way. So when an American citizen is voting for a presidential candidate and a party on the ballot form, and they tick the box that says, for sake of argument, um, Obama, they aren't actually placing a vote for Obama, Obama, technically speaking, they're ticking that they have one vote. They're ticking Obama and they're handing their ballot paper in. But what they're who they're actually voting for is an elector, so a representative who will take their vote and put their vote in a pot for Obama and then vote for Obama. So individual U.S. citizens are participating in what is called the popular vote. So they go along and tick the box, but it's only days later when the electoral college system kicks in and the elector for whatever that region is, the district that you voted as a citizen, places their vote. And they don't have to vote for who you voted for. They don't actually have to vote for Obama. So when you think you voted for Obama, maybe you didn't. And the best recent example of this was in 2000 when Bush was uh, elected. George Bush Jr., he was elected as president even though he lost the popular vote. So more actual American humans voted for Al Gore than George Bush. But George Bush still was elected as president because he had more electoral votes. You need more than 270 electoral votes to win the presidency. He had 271 after a recount, I believe, there's a whole hanging chads scandal where, you know, people were expertly analyzing the hole punches in, in the ballot cards and there was some sort of problem. Uh, it seemed a little bit 
strange and scandalous at the time, but that's what actually happened. So Al Gore, more votes. Al Gore did not become president. (laughs) There's questions hanging over whether or not it is actually a democracy in the United States or whether it is just the illusion of a democracy to stop the, uh, the population revolting. And the way in which the Electoral College votes are distributed is also kind of strange. Um, electors themselves are voted in and they're typically, you know, leaders of the community or, you know, have some political standing. Um, but it seems a bit strange to me that you can win the hearts and minds and popular vote and yet not win the presidency. It just seems completely peculiar, but, uh, certainly the electors vote obviously after the popular vote. And, um, we have the Virginia plan where the representation is by population for the electors. Then you have the New Jersey plan where you have equal state representation because of course you have different populations in different areas, you know, certain states, you know, all, all states will have two senators, uh, but the number of, of representatives may vary depending on the, the, the population of the state, which, which varies hugely. You know, you have the District of Columbia, which is tiny, and then you have California, which is absolutely huge. Um, so it is representative numerically, ultimately, I suppose. But I think, you know, this is certainly something that everybody should be fully aware of and understand what it all means and what, what the, um, you know, the super delegates means and what, um, you know, there's, there's a whole list of, uh, of jargon around this sort, sort of thing. Um, you know, you have the, the various meetings of parties, the so-called, you know, um, delegate dele- delegation parties and you have things like the political action committees which we'll get to uh which is you know tantamount to middleman uh, lobbying uh so it is you know it really structurally right at the very top it makes total sense to me but then it very quickly disintegrates an unbelievable complexity down at the bottom and i think most people just think yeah i don't need to know that i just want to look at the you know as you say the bullet points um but, you know, what it actually means is really quite square. I think my impression is that the average American will probably understand all the way down to swing states and why presidential candidates will get in the bus, the battle bus, and go to very specific places. And it makes sense because, you know, why waste your time in a state where you have a very high majority in the polls? You want to spend your time in states that are less, it's less obvious how they're going to vote. And those are the people you want to try and convince. And that's where you're going to spend most of your time. So, and, and that sort of, that sort of effort stretches all the way from the, the primaries that you voted in all the way through, you know, uh, uh, total, um, endorsement by the party and, you know, uh, proper presidential nominee, uh, towards the finish line. So what was your, uh, primary voting experience like? Well, yes, on Tuesday last week, the June 7th was the presidential primary election ballot, and it was an interesting experience, and it did nothing to dispel my view that they don't want you to vote. (laughs) They make it hard, or something, I don't know. I can't help but feel some kind of cynicism towards the voting experience. A couple of days preceding the actual election day, or the, the, is it the election day or the ballot day, whatever it was, the day you go and vote, representatives of the Ber- Bernie Sanders campaign called me, personally called me to ask, you know, who I'm going to vote for. Oh no, can I rely on your vote for Mr. Sanders at the primary election, uh, the, the presidential primaries? And um, each time they put me on the spot, but it gave me a good opportunity to ask them about it. I was like, okay, well, so what's the deal with Bernie? And it was a similar kind of thing. They kind of sort of outlined a little bit of what he stands for and why it would be good for me and this kind of thing, but they didn't, never got too granular about it. And I understand you can't really do that over the phone. They just wanted my vote. <laughs> so they gave me all the necessary information that I needed. Because, for example, I'd say to them, well, I'm a foreigner. I've only really just recently moved here, so I'm still figuring this stuff out. And so they explained to me where my um, polling station was and stuff. And I didn't. There's certain things I didn't even realize. Like it didn't explain to me that you can only go on one day and you couldn't do it online. You have to actually physically go somewhere, which is fine. So I'm basically showing you and showing you in the world just how much I don't know about stuff. 
So anyway, June the 7th came around and I went and walked to my polling station after work. It stays open until 8 p.m. And there's quite a lot of people there. And how it works was kind of intimidating a little bit as a foreigner. So I, I queued up and then I got to the head of the queue to a guy and he asked to see my ID. So I gave him my driver's license. He looked at it. He looked through this big book he's got. And then he said, oh, um, this is a mail vote. And just stared at me blankly. And I just stared at him blankly back and then said, well, can I vote? And then he kind of like grumbled and said, you have to go speak to that person over there. So, okay. So I went and spoke to that person over there and she looked through my name in the book and said, oh, you are a nonpartisan crossover. <laughs> so I was like, what are you talking about? And she says, are you going to vote Democratic or Republican? And I, I said, well, I'm going to vote Democratic. And she goes, okay, but you're a nonpartisan crossover. She said this again. And there's a whole queue of people. And I felt like I couldn't say to her, what are you talking about? What does this mean? And so she just gave me the ballot, um, the ballot paper, which I've posted in the notes, where it says at the top, nonpartisan crossover. And it's this, basically this huge piece of paper with a, this whole grid of little circles on it. I don't know how similar this is to the UK. Uh, I don't remember this, voting in the UK, this kind of thing. It doesn't look familiar. And then so I go up to a booth, and this is another thing which is interesting because there must be elements of peer pressure or something like that because everyone knows who you're going to vote for or they know which party you're going to vote for, say, because you have to go up to either a Democratic booth, a Republican booth, or a Democrat booth, a Republican booth, um, the other ones. There's like a... Green Party. Uh, and I can't remember the name, the Libertarian. Yeah, Green, Libertarian, and then some other independent one. I can't remember. And so I went over to this booth and then saw all the machinery there, which you can see some of this here, this Inca vote thing. And so you slide your card into this machine and sort of it, and how it works is you, you then thumb through this book. Then you use this kind of special pen, which stamps a little black circle in the appropriate strip of the exposed matrix of the card. So there was some thinking time there. So the first page was easy. It's all the big names, you know, Bernie, Clinton, Trump. But then there was page after page of all these other ballots with billions of names of people I've never heard of. And also being a nonpartisan crossover, whatever that means, I wasn't eligible to vote for some of those. Um, I would have had to do a lot of homework to swat up for it. And it kind of got me thinking, who does that? And I think people here do the homework because they care about their country. I don't think people do that kind of thing back in the UK. Possibly, but I think, I mean, there were never there were never billions of names on any ballot paper that I was ever proffered. And certainly I had read the manifestos of all the main parties. You know. Oh, yeah, all the, yeah, the main ones, maybe three. Well, there are yeah. two main parties and then a, a third one, which is with Ashdown. But what I would do is, oh, no, to, just to end the story. So I went and voted. It wasn't clear that I didn't have to vote for the stuff I didn't know anything about. So I was just looking around for anything that might say, you know, skip this if you, if you have no opinion on this. There's none of that. But anyway, after I finally figured it all out and I went back up to go and hand in my ballot paper, there's a big machine that you put it in. It's like you slide it in, little green light flashes, then it comes back out again, and then they tear you off your receipt. But it kept failing. <laughs> it's like, it, it kept like the red light kept going. Oh, let's try it again. Oh, oop, let's try it again. And it was like, did I screw this up? How did I screw this up? And then he said, oh, this one's going to have to be counted manually. So then he tore it off and then put it in the manual pile. So God knows what's going to happen the, there. The manual Republican pile. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's the area of fudge where if it doesn't go in the way that they want it to go, they can use the manual counting, the, the manual counting platform to uh, manufacture some kind of erroneous result. I don't know. I don't know. There must be a better way. I mean, <laughs> there simply must be a better way. You know, I hesitate to suggest some sort of blockchain technological uh, solution purely because, you know, anything that goes digital can easily be photoshopped. Um, well, yeah, I guess is that that must be the reason why this is so inconvenient, why you can't do it online. Yeah, you physically go to polling stations. I mean, they only, in the UK, it's only fairly recently when they uh, they introduced the the postal vote. It was yeah, always either voting that. by proxy or you know heading off to a polling station on foot. Yeah, so I remember in the that, pouring rain, the the postal vote. But yeah, that's an option here. But surely that's just as vulnerable to. God knows what, as an online vote would be. 
wouldn't it? You can I, intercept I, things that are posted. I can imagine it would be. But again, you know, America is significantly larger. You know, it's a, it's a seriously vast country. So it's everything's harder. I mean, it's, it's odd that you said the polling station was open until 8 p.m. I would have thought it'd be open later than here, which is 10 p.m., you know, to allow... Oh, really? Yeah, so that's odd that it's not exactly that late. I mean, I can imagine a lot of people aren't getting out of work until after that, so it's a bit right. inconvenient by design. Um, so maybe that's a, a democratic conspiracy to make sure, you know, <laughs> only people who don't work vote, uh, which seems to be the vast majority of their voting base. Well, I found that well, when I asked people or when I explained my experiences to them, pretty much everyone I spoke to said that, no, they did theirs in, in the mail. That way they took the time to actually do all the homework and they weren't on the spot and they knew exactly who they were voting for, which is obviously the, the sensible way to do this. But it's a learning curve for me. What can I say? Yeah, it is amazingly complicated. I've created a little glossary in the notes here and I wouldn't mind going through it because, you know, maybe just to trigger memories in my brain about all of this. But, uh, it, you know, go, going, doing a little bit of research, you come across so many different words and you think, what does that actually mean? You know, there's, there's what you think it means and then what it actually means. So just, just going to sprint through this if you don't mind. Um, Bill of Rights, as I've mentioned, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. Simple as that. A caucus. So we often hear about the caucuses over here in the UK. And of course, we in the UK, being Europeans, we think of caucus and we think of, you know, the, the lowlands of Russia. Uh, but no, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, it's a fairly random word. It kind of means a political party. Party. Uh, that's a political party having a party. Uh, but etymologically, as I found, it's probably a corruption. Um, and it reminds me of collared greens, which is, you know, proper terminology now, but it's actually an original corruption. Uh, so probably caucus is some sort of corruption of a previous word, but it doesn't actually in and of, of itself really have any etymology, which is peculiar. Declaration of Independence, of course, a fantastic document, which I think has fallen into disrepair quite significantly. Um, this is their statement of independence, basically. Go away, Brits. Signed by 56 representatives, and I believe it's the Decora Declaration of Independence, which has John Hancock's signature on it. You know, you say, you know, give me your John Hancock, as in give me your signature. And the, the reason for that oh, really? is that John Hancock's signature is so laughably um, elaborate and ornate. <laughs> it just really stands out on the, uh, the declaration. It's quite funny. Uh, a delegate. So a delegate is one of these um, representatives uh, that are, you know, a, a state official representative of some description and I just never could get down to exactly what the definition or parameters are or qualifications. Um, founding fathers. We often hear about the founding fathers and these just simply, it just simply refers to all of those 56 people who signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, we often hear about the GOP over here in the UK. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it mean, we know it means the Republicans, but what does GOP mean? And apparently it means the, gra the grand old it party. The, GOP. the grand old party. Yes, and it just means the Republicans, basically. And the word gubernatorial, I, I thought was strange. What does that mean? And it's simply, it's an adjective. It just means anything that's pertaining to a governor um, of a state or district. Uh, the House of Representatives. So the House of Representatives is part of the the legislature, part of Congress. And the House of Representatives is interesting. There are 435 members, and they all serve two years each. And 435 is the number of people you would need to represent 700,000 people each in the overall population of the United States. So 300 million people, divide that by 435, and you roughly get 700,000 humans. And obviously, district sizes vary. Um, PAC. So yesterday, I was reading in the BBC News about a super PAC, and I thought, wow, what does PAC mean? You know, the BBC typically just assumes you know what it's talking about, unless you go to the website, and the website's very good with glossaries and whatnot. Uh, but a, a PAC is a political action com committee, and what it seems to be, and this seems very odd, it seems to be some kind of money laundering outfit which takes potentially illegal monetary donations to a political party or cause or movement and, and then contributes them on your behalf. So if you're a big arms manufacturer, you could give all of your money to a PAC and then the PAC sort of washes that money and then gives it to Hillary Clinton. 
I mean, that's how I understand it. It seems very odd. It seems, it seems part of the whole lobbying mechanism, which I think knee jerk just means corruption to me. You know, lobbyists are people who you have you have the de- the democratic process and you have individuals and the great American people who can try and influence the way in which their lives are governed by participating in the democratic process, by casting their votes. But if you really want to influence the way in which the country is governed, you have a lobby. So if you're a powerful corporation, you can spend a lot of money on lobbying uh, you know, for particular causes, particular bills, laws, or particular individuals in government. And that could be straight up bribery. And you can imagine all the mechanisms that you could invoke to try and sway someone's, um, the, the direction with which they squirt their power in government. You could say things like, um, I need to talk to you about this law that's going to be passed next month. Why don't you come to my super yacht uh, off the coast of you know, Montenegro uh, for a weekend? Or, you know, I really want to talk to you about this this issue that, that is affecting all of my constituents. Why don't you come down to my casino and uh, we'll talk in front of the lap dancing tables. Or, here, have a whole bunch of cash. Here, have the best seats at some sporting venue. Or, hey, you know what, we'd love to hire someone like you after your political term. So that sort of stinkier, more corrupt side of lobbying is what I think the political action committees are there to try and quell from public view but that could just be me um presidency so i i tried to understand what a president actually is so i look at barack obama and he seems to be a kind of left-leaning sort of fairly lame political token um how much power does he actually have as an individual and he doesn't actually have that much power as an individual other than marketing uh but his cabinet and the whole executive branch does have an awful lot of power as i as i've mentioned he can hire a point a heck of a lot of people um he is the commander in chief i mean he, he actually does run the military um and he's he's there for four years you know at least if he wins another term which doesn't necessarily have to be a contiguous term of four years you know he could be the president the head of the executive branch for eight years uh, I think this is a new thing, the restriction to four-year terms. I think, um, or the number of, you can only have a maximum of two terms. Uh, Roosevelt, he had four terms. Uh, and I think before him, there there were no limits. Um, and the president is, of course, elected by the electoral college system, as I've mentioned, with uh, George Bush getting in despite losing the popular vote. The presidential nominating convention. This is a another party uh, where these delegates elect the presidential candidate for their party. So, you know, you need to decide who is it going to be. Um, it wasn't in this, this for the Republican Party, for instance, it is Donald Trump, uh, but it could have been that guy with the melting face, Cruz, could, could have been him. Uh, it could have been a, a couple of the other scary, scary people. And then primaries, you know, water primaries, but they're just, again, gatherings to try and help hone the votes towards a particular person um you have senators in the senate so you know in the uk when we think of senate we think of the ancient roman empire uh but a senate uh you know it's they all serve six years uh, and i think that's deliberately so it doesn't fall at the same elections don't fall at the same time the presidential elections fall so they're all designed to be slightly out of kilter um super tuesday i still don't understand what that means but i think it's a an, another couple of get-togethers where they collect lots of endorsements for presidential candidates uh the supreme court we've mentioned this is the court with the nine representatives who all serve for life and they deliberate over whether or not laws are laws and then finally swing states and a swing state again as we've mentioned is one that it could go either way and i say either way it really is in one direction or the other direction because it's a two-party system, much like the UK, which which is where we have a lot of kinship. There really are only two parties. I mean, you can you can run for another party, but I mean, you'll never be president. It's not going to happen. You may get some 
representation in the House of Representatives. Uh, but you, you, you know, you'll never be the government. The government will only ever be the Republican Party, who in this country, the, you know, the, the British analog is the conservative party. So this is notionally a political outlook where a smaller government and more personal accountability is preferable versus the Democrats, where our analog is the Labour Party, where it's more socialist leaning. There's more equanimity. Um, I can't pronounce that word, so I'll say equality. Or rather, there's a greater distribution of wealth, or theoretically there is, and there's um, a larger government, larger, more pervasive government body. Uh, but apart from that, there are no other parties. I mean, in the UK, sometimes, you know, we have coalition parties that get elected. But in the States, it pretty much swings, you know, between the two, like ping pong. You know, it's uh, you vote one party in thinking that they're going to do great things and change the status quo. And then by the end of their term, it's, you know, let's kick those dirty bums out and get the other guys and, you know, repeat, repeat to fade. Uh, so those are the main areas that I've encountered reading about American politics. Um, it, it does seem extremely complicated. It does seem kind of kitsch and a little fake, uh, you know, uh, from Donald Trump's orange face, uh, to Hillary Clinton's frightening smile, uh, to all of the, uh, the weird shenanigans and, uh, personal attacks and, uh, and, um, uh, reputational assassination attempts that occur and the dirty tricks and all the rest of it and the skeletons in the closet. You know, it's certainly politics as I recognize it, but it's just on a grander scale and it seems to last a lot longer. Yeah. The thing you said about um, Donald Trump's orange face and Clinton's frightening smile, that's another little facet of this whole political game that I always find perplexing. Just how everyone's so insulted in the most nasty horriblest ways it's like we forget the humans we talk about ted cruz as being this viciously ugly freak <laughs> whose face is melting yeah. how shrill clinton is and her frightening smile and trump christ where do we start with that guy well, i sometimes think we kind of go a little bit too far with this and forget that they're human beings and also we take into consideration their own personal foibles too much you know we shouldn't let that cloud what they're what their actual policies are. So, you know, I've been watching with interest the current presidential chase. Uh, and, you know, now we're down to, you know, as far as pre presidential election is concerned, we really are between um, Hillary Clinton and Donald J. Trump, uh, the former for the Democrats and the latter, obviously, for the Republicans. Um and, you know, it's fascinating. You know, both of them are very newsworthy. We're constantly listening to their sound bites, uh, who they're endorsing. We're, we're, I'm thoroughly fascinated to find out who their vice president choices will be and who their running mates will be. Um, and it's, you know, it's like, um, it's like that quote from Arthur C. Clarke where he said, we are either alone in the universe or we aren't both are equally terrifying. And that's what, how I, I, I feel, feel that about at all. I, I either of that. those two characters becoming president. Hillary, Hillary, to me, I find her, well, she's a criminal. Um, I think she wants a huge government. Uh, she wants to be even more limiting for everybody. I, I see her as a, you know, much more socialist character. And I equate socialism with complete, total economic failure and uh, human misery and a restriction of freedoms. And then Trump, I see as a negotiating deal maker who is probably a heck of a lot more um, qualified than all of the politicians when it comes to negotiation. Uh, but at the same time, he scares me because I think he sees the world a little too black and white. And, uh, and again, foreign affairs could be a little bit tricky, but I think he could be good news for America. I certainly don't think he'll be good news for the rest of the world. I don't share most of your intuitions there. I think you're wrong about Clinton. Not intuitions. These these aren't intuitions. These are just things I've. These are what I've felt from the various media representations of what's going on. I have no intuitions on this whatsoever. I don't vote with hunches. 
I, I take whatever facts I can gather and try and, you know, make a view in my mind. I obviously haven't been following this as closely as you probably have, but uh, some of the things that have happened and some of the opinions that have been expressed have been, I, I think, have been seriously misunderstood by the media. And uh, my, my overall feeling is that the media is trying to destroy Trump, um, but at the same time love him because he's so newsworthy. Whereas Hillary Clinton seems to be getting away with a lot. And, that's, that's uh, you know, true. she's she's saying things where I think, wow, you know, that's incredible. Could you possibly that's say not that? true. I'd say, I think you're just wrong there. I think anything Clinton says is so scrutinized, whereas Trump just says whatever he wants and we just laugh it off. Oh, oh, oh that's Trump. No, I think he's heavily scrutinized. He's constantly being called a liar mm, and a murderer really. and a monster. No, no, but he's not having to kind of justify any of these things. That's that's the difference here. It's just, you know, Trump's doing a Trump. Oh, he, he flip-flopped on this. That's Trump being a Trump. And um, also, we should say that today, I mean, literally today, we had America's worst mass shooting ever. I just suddenly thought that this might totally swing it for Trump. Because he's, you know, if if it turns out that this really is something, you know, ISIS based or some th- there's some grain of Islamic ideology going on here, you know, he's the one that's going to say that. Whereas Clinton most likely won't. Th- this is the problem Trump has. This is uh, this is a this is an example of something I think everyone has gotten wrong about Trump. He, when he originally said that. Until our elected representatives figure out what's going on, we should stop all Muslim immigration, right? And the reason why he said that is completely logical. For instance, if you have a bad apple, right? You're just, it's a bad apple. It's a rotten apple. And you think, oh, gross. And then, you know, the next day you have your apple and it's fine. The next day after that. It's fine. The day after that, it's a rotten apple again. And you're thinking, you know, what the hell? I'm getting these rotten apples. If nobody investigates and it continues and nobody talks about it, you'll just stop eating apples. But if somebody investigates and finds out that there's a crate of rotten apples at the shop and they throw that crate away, then you'll eat apples again, right? So Trump's protest here is that none of the politicians want to say it's a pro it's a mu- it's a problem in the muslim community so they're not saying that it's it's as if they're saying every time this happens they're saying oh you know that's terrible it's uh it's another tragedy of ethnic proportions yeah that guy was a total psycho you know he was against every look <laughs> the fact is there is a muslim problem and if you don't identify it if you don't publicly say that then you are a who the hell's interests are you representing? He sees that as an outrage. He goes, look, it's obvious. Every single suicide bombing that happens in the world, these people are professing to be Muslim radicals. So we do have a problem. But Obama and Hillary are, are hiding because they're liberals. And another problem Trump has, this is another example, is the Mexicans. So he said, you know... Well, hang on, before we step on that, um, yeah, that, that's the point I was making about Trump and the fact that he's actually, he's actually prepared to name the problem, yeah. whereas Clinton sort of dilly-dally, exactly. shilly-shallies over it. Yeah. And I just think people notice that. And that's why I think this shooting now, if it's a, con- if it's a continuation of just dare not speak his, its name, then you know, people are going to be swayed towards someone who appears to be calling a spade a spade. Exactly. And I think that is the truth. And this is what frustrates Trump. And this is why it, it amazes him when he, he cops so much flack over things like building a wall to stop the illegal immigration of Mexicans and getting Mexico to pay for it. And people, liberals, are outraged by this. Oh, my God. How can you say that all of the Mexicans who are illegally coming into our country are criminals? That's outrageous. No, that's a fact by definition. Um Trump doesn't understand having laws that you don't enforce. So he says, what's the point in having a law if you're not going to enforce it? And in fact, when he suggests enforcing a law, suddenly everybody's all upset about it. You know, we don't want 
increased crime rates. We don't want, you know, illegal immigrants coming in. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to stop them coming in. It's like, <laughs> what does that even mean? And this is, this is why Trump has been as successful as he has been. Because people are sick of that. They're absolutely sick of that nonsense coming mostly from the Democrats who, you know, are, are, what is the phrase? The phrase is, um, oh, it's, it's called signaling. It's some sort of signal, virtue signaling. That's it. You signal to say, look at how fantastic I am. You know, I'm doing really good things, but then don't follow through and actually do those good things. And I think a plain speaking president, um, could be a good idea. At the same time, it terrifies me. So I'm watching with much interest. But I certainly think the media has a lot to answer to in terms of, you know, how they distort and overemphasize and just generally sensationalize. I mean, you know, freedom of the press is important. But if, you know, they all seem one-sided, I think, well, that's hardly fair. And they certainly all seem on the on the democratic uh, liberal side to me liberal with the small l uh I, there's a massive character assassination by one of the leading comedy entertainer slash news chat show host i don't know if that's a category john oliver no oh, yeah he yeah. does some program Ish. And Last he week, absolutely tonight. went to town on Trump, you know, calling him outrageous things that if anybody else was called the horrible, awful, terrible things that he was called, it's like, I, you know, and then you have the whole um, freedom of speech thing and we should ban Trump. You know, we should stop Trump coming to the UK. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know our, our, we have a, uh, a Muslim mayor here in London. Uh, Sadiq Khan, who has recently been elected. And he said terrible things about Trump, right? Really horrible, awful things. And when he was saying these things, I thought, if Trump becomes president, <laughs> I mean, and he comes over to London, how is that going to play out? How is he going to sit down at a dinner with Sadiq Khan, who called him, just, you know, horrible, awful things, under, terrible names under the sun? You know, that's terrible politics. So I think people have been very unfair to Trump and they haven't really, haven't really um, engaged him in, you know, bottomed out full investigatory conversations. And I think it's a terrible shame. But if he continues as successfully as he has been so far and he, he really is giving Hillary a proper run for her money, I want to, I want to, I'm really interested to hear some really good debates on exactly what American politics means and how his election might change the, the political landscape of America, which I think would be really considerable. Whereas, you know, I think Hillary Clinton, part of a political dynasty, I think she'll just continue the agenda and, uh, I can't see very much changing at all. But, uh, Hillary, Trump certainly has a lot of ammunition to use in any debates like destroying her attack of Libya and destroying Libya. You know, uh, we came, we saw he died uh, and creating a gold plated avenue from the Middle East straight into Europe, causing the, the migration crisis that is currently occurring. But uh, it's, it's all fun. It's all very interesting. And underneath it all, I still think the American political system seems to be the most democratic despite the fact that you're not actually voting for the president. <laughs> you're not actually directly voting. But anyway, you know, that aside, I think uh, it's a great process. It's just, you know, it's, it's fraught with lots of issues and they're growing issues, like the ludicrous amount of money it takes in order to, to run a campaign, um, how hard it is to change the Constitution. I mean, you know, it's it's almost written in stone, you know, there are the amendments, but getting an amendment is because of the very fail safes that the founding fathers implemented. It's difficult to actually change the governmental system, making the entire country slower by design to progress. So that, you know, that could, that could become a growing issue, especially in a, especially in a world where technologically things are advancing so quickly. I can't remember what the number is, but it's something like you have to get the consensus of like 17 states to write, 
an amendment or modify an amendment or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are checks and balances everywhere, which is a good thing, ultimately. But maybe that might slow the whole process down in a world that seems to be accelerating. Um, it's, it's very, it is very complicated, but it sort of is necessarily complicated. Um, and of course it's litigious, you know, it's, it's every aspect of government is just, you know, absolutely crawling with, uh, constitutional lawyers. Um, so it's heavy, heavily buried under law generally. Uh, the presidency seems to be overvalued in my view. Uh, the two party system again seems is how can that possibly be representative? How can it be possibly be representative when you have political dynasties? Um, the, the funding, yeah, the way funding works and campaign funding and, uh, you know, that whole special interest groups and lobbying, all of that seems a bit dirty and that should probably be reformed. The size of the government seems to be huge. I mean, um, I got this from CNS news. Uh, apparently the ratio between government employees uh, to manufacturing is 1.8 to 1. So 22 million government employees, 12 and a half million manufacturer, you know, people employed in the manufacturing industry. I mean, that seems a bit crazy, doesn't it? Uh, so, you know, and then you, then of course we have the issues with foreign policy, you know, the perceived imperialism, America first, all about the oil, um, and oil is important. Uh, keeping keeping other countries a little bit shaky, uh, you know, the low intensity combat um, strategy, uh, the incredible number of military bases uh, all around the world. Uh, I read that, and I quote: "The United States probably has more foreign military bases than any other people, nation, or empire in history." While there are no freestanding foreign bases permanently located in the United States, there are now around eight hundred U.S. bases in foreign countries. That's from the Nation magazine. Um, so it's scary. It's big. America's powerful. It's the probably the only superpower in the world. You know, everything that happens in America, there are reverberations throughout the world. Um, someone once said, I don't know whether or not it was America they were referring to, but when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. But it's true. So, you know, everybody should be interested in the American political scene because it affects everybody in the world. And I think that's true. And, you know, the media seems to be slanted everywhere, including the BBC. Uh, but we shall see. So how are you going to vote? Well, I'm going to vote for Hillary. Really? I voted for her. In, well, who else am I going to vote Trump. for when it comes to the... Uh, I'm not going to vote for Trump. you got to be kidding me. Why? <laughs> because I think... He will do the same damage to the United States, or at least reputationally, as Bush did. And he says a bunch of crazy, scary stuff. And he just does. Like when he talks about deporting, you know, deporting Mexican immigrants. Yeah. Seriously, how, how the hell is he going to do that? Well, the law says he should. He would just be enforcing the law. What about like the kids that these illegal Mexican immigrants might have, and th let's say that they were born legally in this country? What happens to them? Well, he'll change. He'll probably change the legal status of the children of illegals born in America. These are so-called anchor babies, and I think he probably would change the law. If you have a baby illegally in the United States, that baby doesn't automatically become an American. That's what he'll do. I and I and just another thing. Just I would just in a historical sense, I just wouldn't vote for a Republican as well because they seem to be on all the bad side of everything. Like what? Like like reducing the size of government, reducing the tax bur burden, and giving people more personal accountability so they don't become dependent on the welfare state. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with um, reducing the size of government. Also, I don't agree with how they would like to keep the top earners paying as little tax as possible that i don't agree with that i mean these are you know these are like the, the big the high-end things what else just freaking everything just just everything they're on the wrong side of well according to you <laughs> okay well i mean i didn't agree with anything you said there. based initiatives i think you know uh, this whole wealth distribution thing i like the idea of most of the money being in the hands of the really smart successful intelligent people uh i think that's probably a good idea and taking money away from them by force and distributing it distributing it distributing it i think that's problematic basically the the democrats 
have more force. They are forcibly telling you what to do and forcibly taking your money away and more of it. I think we should reduce that. I think any country should reduce the amount of force and increase the amount of voluntary participation. So, for instance, we have the same issue with the the EU here in the UK. And, you know, it's it's if you had to have trade tariffs with particular products, surely that's better than general taxation. For instance, here in the UK, we have the National Health Service. If you're unhappy with the National Health Service and think that, you know, it's because there's no competition that they continue their low standards and you wanted to get out and pay for your own private health care, you may think that's competition, but it isn't because you're still being taxed. Your tax money is still going to the NHS. It's not like the the uh, HMRC are going to say, uh, okay, so now that you have private health care, we're going to refund you all of this massive amounts of tax that we take from you in order to fund the NHS. That's not how it works. The government will take and keep that money. So more competition, less monopoly, more personal accountability, less telling you what to do. I, I, I have to say, Trump at this point is sounding <laughs> like he makes more sense than Hillary Clinton. At this point. If I had a choice and I were a voting American, I'd rather vote not for either of them but uh you know it seems as though you only have two choices and they're both really bad but it'll be interesting to see if trump got in i can imagine hillary would go to jail um because of this uh, email scandal and maybe benghazi i don't know and maybe libya uh but if hillary gets in i i just i think taxes are going to go up considerably um and whether that's a good thing i don't know but anyway, it's it's fascinating. I fully understand why people get so worked up about politics and uh, and how and how and how powerfully how powerful changes can can sweep in with new governments. I mean, you know, perhaps uh, whoever gets in, maybe uh, the Obamacare. I forget what it's actually called. The something Health. Affordable Care Act. Yeah, something like that. I think you know, maybe that will be repealed. Who knows? Uh, but again, we shall see. It's all very interesting. Uh, unless you have anything to add, I'll wrap it up by saying you have been listening to Eclecticist, the podcast where we talk about absolutely anything, but preferably things that we think we need to know a little bit more about. It gives us an excellent excuse to do a little bit of reading and get a little bit smarter, and have a better opinion. Uh, you can find the notes for all of our shows, as well as all of our shows, at our webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. At the bottom, there is a contact form, so if you have any ideas for topics or any general feedback, please fill it in and click the button. We don't know what we're going to be talking about next time, but again, any suggestions, please pass them along. It could well be, and I warn you, the EU referendum. We don't have any me- music to play out with this time around unfortunately i tried to get a hold of the national anthem but uh, i think that's under copyright so i couldn't get a hold of it uh we will see you next time thank you very much and good evening